I know Coimbra for a long time ago uh, because of the connection with the, uh, the faculty of uh, philosophy of Coimbra, uh, of the Jesuit in the 16th century, and uh, many books, in fact, uh, what we call the Conimbrincenses, uh, the uh, Aristotelian commentaries on Aristotle, in fact, those books uh, were produced in Coimbra, and they were brought uh, to China, uh, a big collection by uh, Nicolas Trigo, a Flemish Jesuit. He brought those book in 1619, and after that, uh, there were for 20 years, 30 years in China, from 1620 to 1640, there were a team of uh, Jesuit and Chinese scholar, and they worked together uh, to translate all those conibrin chances. And it is why we have already in, Ch in Chinese, but probably it is uh, uh, unique, I mean, this, uh, uh, all this Aristotelian philosophy was uh, translated into Chinese uh, at that time, at, in late Ming Dynasty. And so we have a kind of a, a complete corpus of Aristotle uh, with the books on, uh, uh, on the physics, on the generation and corruption, on the soul, on the dialectics, on uh, ethics, uh, on the meteorology, on heaven. And so we have all this corpus of text which was transmitted to China and he had a, a strong influence uh, uh, in, in China, because it was the first time for uh, uh, in China to get uh, uh, acquainted with uh, Western philosophy. So many new concepts were introduced, for example, the concept of the soul, eh, which is, uh, does not really exist in China, this concept of the soul, so there was a neologism which was created at that time by the Jesuit, eh, we call in Chinese Ling Run, and until today we are we are using that word, and which is still very common in Chinese language. And so we see this kind of uh, uh, intellectual uh, work between culture has started already very early, and the Coimbra uh, really play a very important role in that, because it introduced uh, to China not only theology, but also uh, philosophy, eh? and philosophy on a very broad aspect, because uh, at that time, I mean, philosophy not only includes what we today we think about metaphysics or ethics, but at that time also, uh, philosophy includes also natural philosophy, so the, uh, about physics, uh, I mean, cosmology, all of that. And so uh, it has a tremendous impact in China, and starting this kind of dialogue between uh, Chinese culture and the West, and, uh, and this dialogue is still going on. I mean, it's still uh, uh, deepening, and, uh, and it's, it's very, very important for, for, uh, uh, for China to, uh, to get into relation with the world uh, and, and, and try also to understand its relation with its own philosophy, its own tradition. So today, uh, in fact, uh, I was invited to that conference, and for me, it is completely a new field uh, of uh, studies because I, uh, I, I have to confess my ignorance. I didn't know about uh, the philosophy of care, and I didn't know that it was a, such an established uh, field of studies uh, in Europe and in America. And, and I think uh, I, I don't, I've not heard about it in China, but probably uh, I, think, I think it would be very important uh, to bring this field uh, in China because of its uh, strong focus on the person and how to, to take care of person, to make person at the center of the, of, of the reflection. Uh, so I'm going to, to uh, today to, to take a very different approach that we have heard the last uh, uh, two days because we are I'm going to, to bring you to a different road and the road is going to go towards uh, Asian philosophy and toward Buddhism. And that may be a challenge, and because we are going to, to, to see uh, how uh, Buddhism has a deep consideration for, uh, for the person, at the same time is going to deny the, the basis of the person. Uh, the concept of personhood or the self is going to be deconstructed. And so I will talk about uh, how the Buddhists do that, and I, I, also I will go also across 
analytic philosophy, and, uh, which also try also uh, to understand uh, uh, the relevance of, of, of Buddhism and uh, its notion uh, of person in relation to, to, the, to, to the care. So, uh, I mean, if you have my text, and if not, uh, we, you have here uh, above my head, uh, you have the text I'm going to read. So, care and the Buddhist compassion. In Western philosophy, the care for others was traditionally grounded on metaphysics and an ontology of the person. However, contemporary philosophy attempts to reframe the concept of person through the resources of hermeneutics and analytical philosophy, rearticulating the relation between ethics and metaphysics. And in the past two days, we have heard a lot about uh, uh, some attempts, for example, in hermeneutics with uh, uh, Ricoeur and, uh, and also analytical philosophy. So in developing the philosophy of care for today, it may be useful to bring into the discussion the perspective of Asian tradition, and more specifically, Mahayana Buddhism. Quite paradoxically, Mahayana stresses the importance of compassion for others as a path of ultimate liberation, while claiming that persons do not really exist. After a brief historical overview of the development of Mahayana concept of compassion, we shall illustrate here the consideration of a 20th century Chinese philosopher showing that compassion can lead to a deep spiritual experience of liberation. Intellectually, there seems to be a paradox between compassion and the doctrine of no self or no person. And we shall see how an analytic philosopher deal with this paradox, promoting the idea of ironic engagement. Then we shall attempt to investigate how the Buddhist notion of compassion can enrich our notion of care. So the first point is from wisdom to compassion. It will be more kind of a historical uh, framework. For uh, Theravada Buddhism, the most important condition for enlightenment is wisdom. So in Sanskrit, prajna, or in Chinese, zhe hui. That is a complete understanding of the four noble truths. So the truth about suffering, its origin, and how to distinguish this suffering and the way. And when wisdom is obtained, compassion, karuna, or in Chinese, tsebe, come as a necessary consequence. Having purified his mind of all defilements, the Buddhist practitioner is now enjoined to do good and avoid evil according to the Eightfold Path. And so it is, a, uh, we say, the, the right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and concentration. And so that is the, the practical way to do that in daily life. So compassion uplifts wisdom to a higher stage since it induces a certain kind of Buddhist practice which plays an important role in reaching perfect wisdom. So much that Theravada emphasizes the personal benefits of practice for attaining wisdom. The practitioner lives a moral life according to Buddhism and, by compassion for others, still entangled in the illusion of the self and of the world, he teaches them wisdom. So this great compassion, the Maha Karuna, is considered the last or ultimate of the 18 virtues of Buddha. In brief, the in, the per in the perspective of Theravada Buddhism, Moral life is a consequence of the enactment of wisdom. In the first century AD, the rise of the Mahayana movement within Buddhism allocated to compassion a more foundational position, 
by which compassion became equated with wisdom. Compassion then became the essential quality of the Bodhisattva, who works for the liberation of all sentient beings and the condition or foundation for enlightenment. <coughs> Unlike Theravada, which considers compassion as a consequence of enlightenment, Mahayana understands that compassion, like wisdom, is in fact the source, the essence, the condition for enlightenment. For Mahayana Buddhism, individual enlightenment cannot happen in isolation from others, but only by working towards the enlightenment of all. This explains the reason for the Bodhisattva vow. And so the vow is not to attain nirvana for oneself alone, but to bring all sentient beings to enlightenment. And so that is the, the, the vow that made by the Bodhisattva. They have the possibility to reach nirvana, to leave somehow this world, but they renounce to that and they say, I'm going to stay in the world and to uh, bring to the enlightenment of all sentient beings until the final enlightenment of all can be realized. So while the Eightfold Path in Theravada stressed the personal benefits of practice, the Mahayana developed a new framework called the Six Perfection, based on altruistic practices. So the donation, so, of course, it will be donation mostly uh, to the Sangha and to the Buddhist community. Eh? So the donation, morality, forbearance, effort, meditation, and wisdom. And so here, even meditation and wisdom are considered as altruistic practice. Eh? And so I say in this list, the first three practices clearly have a social dimension. But even the next three practices have also a strong social dimension. For example, individual meditation in the Mahayana tradition is focused on developing skill to train the mind to be compassionate for all sentient beings. And so I don't know if some of you have done already some Zen practice. It's what we do to that, that our mind somehow as to reach out all sentient beings. So for the Royan school, a school of Mahayana, which flourished in China under the Tang Dynasty, the six perfections constitute the first six stages leading to wisdom. But this leads further to four other stages in which compassion is brought to its completeness. In the seventh stage, the practitioner is born into this world to bring liberation to all sentient beings. He becomes a bodhisattva. In the eighth, he works to transfer his merit to others by means of the va of bodhisattva. And in the nine, he achieves a complete compassion, and in the tenth, he attains Buddhahood. So that is something very peculiar to Bahayana Buddhism, eh, is this idea of bodhisattva. Eh? We reach Buddhahood not directly from a kind of individual enlightenment, but we reach it through compassion. Eh? And so through this vow of bodhisattva to work for the enlightenment of others. So the bodhisattva goes to the extreme of compassion since he or she makes the total sacrifice of himself for others. As the 8th century Indian Buddhist monk and scholar Santiveda says, may a rain of food and drink descend to clear away the pain of thirst and anger. And during the aeon of famine, may I myself change into food and drink. Indeed, what a better proof of the non-existence of the self that sacrificing oneself for the other, showing him that he should not cling to the self. We could say that the Bodhisattva is like a martyr, in the sense that he sheds his life for others in order to witness 
Eh? And so that is uh, the etymological sense of the use of the word martyrium eh, in Greek or Latin, eh, to be a, a witness, the witness of a truth for the other, a truth which consists for Christian in the salvation in Jesus Christ and for the Buddhist in the liberation from the entanglements of the self. So Buddhism holds the idea of karmic retribution, meaning that good deeds will necessarily produce good results in the future, while bad deeds bring bad consequences. So thus, an ethical action brings necessarily merits, but the ethical agent should do it without considering the merits. So as Kogen Mizumo says, donation is conceived as a selfless, unconditioned act in which there is no consciousness of being either the giver or the receiver, and no thought of reward or merit from the act of donation. End of quote. This being said, the Pure Land tradition of Mahayana greatly emphasizes the accumulation of merits. In Chinese, we call that a gongde, a through charitable action to obtain a better reincarnation in the next life. And this may lead to build an attachment to the self, which runs contrary to the spirit of Buddhism. But the karmic law of retribution operates absolutely only within the samsara, within this world, the cycle of death and birth which constitutes the world. And the aim of Buddhism, precisely, is to go beyond the samsara, to go to the nirvana, eh, where the karmic law becomes inoperative, and does not work, there is no karmic, uh, uh, because uh, when we reach a uh, nirvana, in fact, there is no any action happening, and because there is no action, there is no consequence. It is only in the samsara that there is this, uh, uh, that we produce a thought, we produce deeds, that are going uh, to plant seeds and to produce in the future uh, other results. But in the nirvana, in nirvana, there, uh, it will be uh, there will be not such a thing. So the idea of uh, uh, pure land Buddhism, pure land Buddhism is going to emphasize uh, for the people to do good deeds so that they can get in the next life a better reincarnation. But that is not the end. And, uh, for Buddhism. The real end of Buddhism is not to get a better reincarnation, but is not to be reincarnated again, not to be born again. And that is the, the final end of Buddhism. So, uh, compassion, so my second point, compassion toward others as a path of liberation. A true compassion towards someone who suffers involves and requires the role of the psychological and moral resources of a person. And so I would like here to illustrate with the example of a Chinese Buddhist philosopher, uh, Liang Shuming. Uh, he was born in 1895 and he died in 1988. So, like Buddha, he was personally shocked by human suffering. Uh, for example, the, de the death of friends, but also, one day he was in Beijing and he took also uh, uh, the rickshaw. And so he was, uh, he was very much shocked by seeing the suffering of the rickshaw puller uh, and uh, all those, uh, those people. And so, but also he was also very sensitive to the suffering of the plants and animals that, that we make die to feed us. And so all his life, he keep a vegetarian diet and not to, uh, to eat animal. And so that also, uh, vegetarianism in, in China is very much part of the Buddhist practice. So he became extremely sensitive to the suffering of others, especially people facing death. From the point of view of Buddhism, death itself should not be feared. But it is only because people are attached to life that they fear to lose it. The one who has cut all the attachment to life could possibly escape completely the cycle of death and birth and be reborn in the nirvana. 
when the young witness the psychological suffering of the person refusing to die, he was giving rise to a true and real feeling, making the suffering of the other his own suffering. Liang will know intellectually that the anxiety of the other, uh, anxiety facing death, this anxiety is ill-founded, unnecessary, and ultimately empty. But instead of teaching a Buddhist philosophy, he will feel himself the moral pain for the other. And moved by this feeling of compassion, Liang will then be compelled to decide to leave the world. That is, to renounce to all the attachment to the illusion of the world. Liang thought that only this attitude of renouncement could awaken the other in his final hour, so that he could live peacefully the world, renounce all the attachment to life, and avoid perpetuating his existence of anxiety into a new reincarnation. The compassionate person and the dying person could communicate with one another at the deepest level of reality beyond both life and death. So Liang was somehow restating uh, or repronouncing this ideal of Bodhisattva we talk about above, being someone who is able by his attitude of not grasping, of not craving on life, to awaken the other to another dimension of reality, so that both find liberation from the psychological attachment to life and reach together ultimate liberation. Those thoughts of Liang Shuming may help us to understand that the care for others take into consideration not only the material needs of the other, but more importantly is the spiritual welfare. It does not suffice to give food and alleviate physical pain, but true compassion embraces as much as possible the moral anxiety of the other to find together liberation. Without walking with the other the path of anxiety and finding together a way out, the compassion for the other, the care for him, will be necessarily limited and even misguided. And so now I will turn to my third point and uh, about the, co the concept of person with uh, analytic philosophy. So for Buddhism, the self or personhood does not exist. And yet, this illusion of the existence of the self creates real suffering, which is very real and concrete. And only by going beyond the illusion of the self can we get liberated from suffering. Because the practice towards liberation needs to engage all the psychological resources at the individual level, Buddhism recognizes that the idea of a self can still be a useful convention or conventional truth, as long as it is not construed as an absolute truth, which would hinder liberation for oneself and for others. Indeed, the negation of the self appears devastating for any ethical enterprise. If there is no idea of a self, if I myself and the other are not real, then I have no good reason to care for me and for others. Also, if the other person lacks any uniqueness and particularity, the act of caring becomes anonymous and disengaged toward the concrete other. And the caregiver fails to show due respect to what matters most to the other beyond the act of care, that is, to be recognized for who he is. In other words, the Buddhist negation of the idea of self appears making the ethical relationships completely impersonal and disengaged, failing to reach its real target. So in a book called the Personal Identity and Buddhist Philosophy, Empty Person, 2003, 
the American philosopher Mark Sideritz uses analytic philosophy to show the articulation between the Buddhist negation of the idea of person and the Buddhist affirmation of the legitimacy of the idea of a person as a conventional truth. And this articulation is aptly expressed by uh, two words within the title, empty person. In chapter five of his book, Sideritz deals specifically on the ethical dimension of the question. And he comes forth with the idea of a middle path in ethics. And he calls that ironic engagement. So he says, we are able of engaged attitude despite the knowledge that will seem distancing in the way irony is usually thought to be. Sideritz shows the need for a full engagement in two points. First, cultivating attitude toward person alleviate more effectively the suffering of concrete person and promote their individual welfare. Beyond the help given to concrete person, the engagement toward them is indirectly instrumental in alleviating the overall suffering and promoting the overall welfare. Second, only by being engaged with concrete person and paying attention to their specific needs, only by having heartfelt compassion toward other, I am effectively focused on the need of the other. I do not treat the recipient as a mere means to some private end of the caregiver. Engagement should be full and real. But at the same time, he qualifies the attitude of his engagement as being ironic. And he says, we can be genuinely engaged person while still preserving the sense of irony to escape the suffering that is the usual fate of person. We are smart enough to do two things at once. So this sense of irony does not deny the reality of suffering, but denies making a suffering the ultimate and absolute reality. So the word irony, I think it is used in the English uh, meaning of the word irony, understood here not as a form of derision and mockery, and because in French we have the idea of uh, uh, irony, and it's a kind of derision or a kind of mockery. Eh? But I think in English, the word irony has not this meaning of uh, derision and mockery eh, that he has in the French language, but I think mostly the word derision here points out as a kind of discrepancy between the appearance and the reality. And so I think it is uh, the meaning here that uh, is used by uh, Sideritz when he talks about uh, uh, this ironic engagement. In, this, in his last chapter, Sideritz applies his concept of ironic engagement to the notion of bodhisattva. There, the ironic engagement does not focus exclusively on the notion of person, but it extends to all our ontological commitments because the bodhisattva remains in this world without being attached to it. Sideritz analyzes a traditional exercise of compassion for the aspirant bodhisattva, by which one exchange identity with the other. Again, it is an exercise that we do often in the Zen meditation. So one seeing oneself from the first person perspective of those enlighten and suffering individuals one wishes to help. And so you take the place of the other person, you see, from the point of view of the other. So by adopting the point of view of the other, which is, after all, an illusion, same as mine, one can effectively discard his attachment to his own subjectivity. Also, only by taking the perspective of the unenlightened, the bodhisattva can effectively help them acting in a certain way and reframe, refrain from bad karmic deed. And Sideritz stresses that there may be the risk 
of acquiescing in the bad habits and the preferences that create suffering. And therefore, the Bodhisattva must retain firmly his commitment to avoid any attachment and defilement. The quality required in this regard is flexibility, avoiding superiority and overbearing. It seems to me that this notion of ironic engagement is quite helpful if it is not understood in a nihilistic fashion, but as expressing the unavoidable tension between the concreteness of our engagement and their openness to a reality beyond every words and deeds. The irony opens precisely a space, a distance, by which our full engagement and care for concrete persons escape the conceptual and psychological attachment to our own self and to others. Ironic detachment, uh, engagement sorry, does not imply a detachment from a concrete person, as if we do not really care for them, but a kind of engagement which opens the relationship to something beyond. So, my last point, contribution of Buddhism towards the notion of care. So I would like here to spell out what the contribution of Buddhism to our modern conception of care could be. The first contribution could be in the purification of our will to care for others, in which there may be strong affective and selfish dimension. The will to care for others can be a way to dominate and control the other. And Nietzsche, and we have mentioned uh, yesterday, had shown us how a certain kind of Christian ethics could be seen as a kind of domination, oppressing the life of the individuals. And more recently, uh, Foucault had shown us how pregnant was the technological control of our modern society over human biological life. In the domain of medical care, voices are raised against prolonged artificial life support. Now, in French, uh, we say acharnement thérapeutique, by which uh, human life is supported through extraordinary and artificial means without consideration of the general good of the person. In all such instances, Buddhism would deconstruct the ideological construction upon which are built our ethical action. Especially prevalent is a common conception establishing a duality between the one who performs the ethical act and the one who receives it. On the contrary, the Buddhist compassion does not postulate that there is a fundamental difference between the self and the other. But Buddhism considers the duality between myself and other as a construction based on our ignorance. And thus, it in invites each to return to the true nature common to all, which is no self. By returning to this common nature, there are fewer projections over the other. Another contribution of Buddhism is to stress the universal dimension of ethics. As we have said, the Bodhisattva makes a vow to help all sentient beings to get liberated from ignorance and suffering. For practical matters, one is limited in its psychological and material means. But ideally, it should make no difference among people. The migration crisis that we are facing in many parts of the world today bring a challenge to this ideal of universality. While our ethical deeds usually start from the people closer to us and connected naturally by blood, language, culture, and politics, the ideal of Bodhisattva challenges our conceptual, psychological, and institutional attachment to those concepts of blood, language, culture, and politics and opens to a beyond. Also, Buddhism offers intellectual and moral resources to widen the scope of ethics in encompassing all sentient beings. 
an ethics which will be constructed only on the concept of human person, understood in isolation from the other form of life, seem today inadequate. It may not be useful and necessary to adopt the notion of transmigration or metempsychosis, which was also had by Pythagoras and Plato, to assert here this widening of ethics towards all forms of life. The Buddhist deconstruction of the notion of person and the commitment of the Bodhisattva towards all sentient beings are enough for promoting a renewal of our reflection for a care extended to all forms of life and beyond to the entire earth. In conclusion, I hope to have shown that the Buddhist notion of compassion could be an important resource for our reflection on the roads to care. This compassion takes into consideration the needs of the other and yet refuses to enclose the other in his needs and instead promotes a common path of liberation from the unnecessary anxiety of life towards a greater freedom. Thank you.